How many of you, that's more than just a song, with a great beat, with a wonderful tune, with a nice arrangement, that even if they did not play this song this way, this was something you could say amen to. See, when, when the scripture is put to song, it helps a lot. We talked about that last week when we talked about the word put to song. And you know, this whole song was taken out of the songs. And the whole deal is that how many of us have tasted? And we see, see, see once, once you taste something and it hooks you, you can't walk away. And so I don't understand how someone can say, I knew the Lord, but I decided not to follow him anymore. Then I want to ask, what did you taste? Because if you really had connected and tasted of who the Lord is, there's no turning back. Oh, your focus may go off as ours tend to do. We may actually wander some as can happen but you never forget that taste. Now I would encourage somebody today that even if your focus has gone down, has shifted, has changed, that if that is the case, just remember the taste. And if you haven't tasted, he's waiting for you to taste. He didn't say try, taste. See, there's a difference between trying and getting a good taste. Anybody ever had you to try something? And then you take as small a piece as you can. And they say, come on, taste it. <laughs> come on, taste it. And then you're eat it. That's right. Come on, eat it. Put it in your mouth. And then when you taste it, you're like, oh, my. That is Jesus. Amen, amen. You can turn with me to the book of Psalm. We are continuing through that and actually this last song just set it up perfectly i don't know that y'all knew or planned that but that was the lord turn with me to the 86th psalm and um, we're going to be looking throughout verse 1 through 13 but in your bulletin i believe you have some verses that we are going to read together and i'm going to read it with you i need to grab a bulletin from somebody because i didn't grab one on my way in thanks sis if we can stand for the reading of God's word, we have there the verses that will that I wanted us to remember and to focus on. Um, although we're looking at 1 through 13, we're going to focus on here <clears throat> these verses as we read together. So, uh, the 86th division of the psalm, starting at verse 1. Let's read together, everyone. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life. For I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Amen. You may be seated. As we are continuing on, it is still summer. And although some have started back, you are still able to continue to refresh and hopefully that you have and you've allowed God to really water your soul. But in order to truly refresh sometimes and to continue strong in the Lord, the servant of God must recognize his or her complete and desperate need for his master. The master has, and they know it, the master has all she needs. Give a little background on this particular psalm. And we'll pray and we'll jump in. This is a 
psalm of prayer, but this is a psalm that was written over time. Every, every phrase, just about every line and phrase in this psalm can be found somewhere else in another psalm or in the Old Testament somewhere. It is, a belief, it is ascribed to David, and it is a later psalm. It came later on in life. And what he did, this, this, this psalm of prayer, this is one of those that didn't, he just didn't grab phrases from all over the place and put them into one. This has been prayers and sayings and things that have been said about God and who he is over time, and people have recognized it as true, and he did his best compilation. You ever have some of your favorite artists, and you have songs from different albums that you like, and then they finally put it all on one, and you go, you got to get that one. Well, this is like that with prayer in that he has pulled together these phrases about the Lord that when you are in need and he is positioning himself, knowing that he's a servant of God, calling on his master. So the message today, we're going to talk about a servant calls on his master. A servant calls on his master. Let's go before the Lord. Father, thank you that we get to sit before your word. Thank you that we get to learn. We get to hear, Lord, and from this we get to follow and obey. I pray, God, that our hearts would be tuned to you, that we would hear what you were saying, that we would see you more clearly, and that, Lord, we would follow you more intently. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so what David actually does here is he has put together from tried and true and tested sayings and words about the Lord and about him as a servant, about us as a servant, and about walking under, uh, I mean, walking as a servant under the Lord as a master, put it all together and said, when you really need to call on the Lord, I'm going to give you a psalm that puts the best of the best together. And he says, and I'm going to help you, and he's helping himself. I'm going to help you to call on the Lord truly, efficiently, focused. It's almost as if he's reorienting himself. As you, as you hear what he's asking, you can, you can hear him saying, Lord, reorient me. You ever use the GPS? For me, I, I like to use my phone and Sometimes if you want to look ahead, you'll kind of scan on the phone, and it has a little feature on my phone that says recenter. It says so, because I've gone all over the map. I've been trying to see the way. I've been trying to learn where I'm going to go next, but I've lost the immediate set of directions. And if I just press the recenter, it brings it back to where I am and need to be, so I have immediate instructions. And for some of us at times in life, we, we are out there trying to find out so much that we lose our orientation. And we have to recenter ourselves. For a pilot, one of the worst things that you can do is to lose your orientation of the sky and the ground. You think up is down and down is up, you have a problem. Or well, be like that comic, I used to love reading The Far Side. I don't know how many people remember that comic. The Far Side, and there's this one comic, and he's always, he's the master of the one scene with the caption. And on The Far Side, these pilots are riding in the fog, and they've lost their orientation. And as they come, there's an opening in the clouds, and one of the pilots says, I wonder what that mountain goat is doing in the clouds. The deal was they were, and they were getting ready to face a mountain but thought they were higher. The deal becomes we lose our orientation and we need to be recentered. And David today takes us to that in his prayer. Here's what we're going to look at. <clears throat> As we look at this, we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at how he recognized God's position and power and also as a result how he recognized his privilege from God. So he recognizes God's position and God's power, and then he also wants to recognize in his prayer the privilege that he's received from God. And that's going to give for us that as we refresh two things, actually three things to remember, but one we'll talk about together is God's position 
and power or his ability, and then our privilege. And I want to make sure that we understand that word privilege, because I'm not talking about our, our <clears throat> although it is, it's been given as a right to, um, as being a child of God, it is a privilege. It is not something that we come demanding as if God owes us something. But sometimes we get exhausted, I think, because we've lost our orientation, we've lost our view of God's position, we have forgotten his power, and we have probably taken advantage of our privilege. And we find ourselves exhausted and sometimes ready to quit. Let's see what he says. So he starts up and he says, incline. The first thing he says, he speaks to God. As a matter of fact, just a quick note, this whole psalm, all of it is directed to God and God alone. Some of the psalms that you read, he will talk to himself. You know, why so downcast my soul? Put your trust in God. You know, sometimes he'll talk about the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And there are times that he'll talk about his enemies. Um, but here, this whole prayer, he is, it is as if he is focused with hawk eye attention on the Lord. And sometimes for you and I, the only way we will get refreshed is when our focus is only on God. We have been distracted by people. We have been distracted by situations. We have been distracted by what others are doing. We've been distracted by what's not happening or what's happening. And sometimes we just need to focus on God. And, and you know what? God goes, talk to me. No, no, no. Don't talk to her. Don't talk to him. As a matter of fact, don't even talk about her and him. Talk to me. And for someone this morning, God is saying, your refreshment will come when you just talk to me and me only. So let's look what he says. So he says, verse 1, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. There's a couple of things that that, that, that request implies. Number one, that incline means really to bow down. So the position that he understands God is in is a high position. He wants God to come down. He wants God to come to his level. God, I need you. I need you to actually, it is, uh, and we shared this a few weeks ago, God bowing and inclining the ear. When you want to hear something more intently, or sometimes when a child is talking, you have to, you have to come down. If you had no intent on hearing what they had to say, you'd stand there and you'd just let them talk. Lips moving, sound coming out the mouth, you're really not listening. But the moment you want to hear what someone is saying, you lean in. And what he's asking God to do is lean in, Lord. I need you. But what he has implied is I recognize we are not equals. I recognize we are not on the same level. I recognize that you're not my buddy. I know sometimes we like to make God, you know, be the, the relevant God he is, but God is not your buddy. God is not my homeboy. Although I do commune with him, I recognize the position. He is a high God who is deciding to bend down low so he can hear me. But not only does it talk about his position, it talks about mine. He recognizes that he is low. And here's the deal. For some of us, boy, the pride is so high that we won't pray. Some of us, and I've been there, we get mad at God. And I don't want to talk to you. I'm not saying anything to you, God, as if he is now hurt by you not speaking to him. You ever had a child do that to you? I remember when I did that. First time I can remember doing that to my mother. And I said, I'm not your friend. <laughs> I said to my mom, I'm not your friend. She said, I'm not yours either. <laughs> I looked at her. She says, I'm your mom. She says, I'm your mother. I'm not your friend. Or sometimes in the communication, I'll say things in a way and in a tone that wasn't warranted for the relationship, and she'll say, don't forget, I'm not, your, I'm not one of your buddies. Now, don't forget that. That was a wonderful warning that says the next time there may not be conversation. 
But what I recognize is although there was relationship, there was a difference in position. And for some of us, we can't get an audience with the Lord because we keep thinking he's just sitting there with us in our seat just like any other friend in school, and I can talk to him as I want. I can come to him as I want. Now, although I can say and speak my heart, yes, I can, and although he wants to hear me truly, I recognize who he is. Do you? Do you recognize who the Lord is when you come before him, or do you even come before him? or do you just expect him to do? Just do it. Come on, just, just do it. You, God, you know what I want, and why do I need to ask you? You know what I want. See, the fact that he asks demonstrates, not to God, because God knows it already, it helps David to know, I'm in need of God. When was the last time you let God know you are in need of him by the way you live? So he says, incline your ear. But here's what I like, too. He says, I understand that... When you incline your ear, there's something that I'm going, to, I'm going to expect because I'm coming to you because I recognize you actually have the answer. Some of us, we can't get refreshed because we're going to the wrong place for the answers. And so the fact that God wants to help us, but I go to my friend, you know, I'm having a hard time with that sister and man. Um, I just want to talk to you about it. And, you know, you guys may talk, and you may, but the first place you may actually need to go is to the Lord. Because the Lord may actually, instead of him focusing on her or him, and sometimes we know that we don't come to the Lord, he will focus on you. I'm all mad at you because you haven't done what I wish that you would do. And God turns the table on you and shows you yourself. You ever had that happen? Well, you are angry at someone or you are having a hard time dealing with someone or, or you are having a hard time dealing with a particular situation or event in life and you come to the Lord and the Lord just reveals you to you. And what you end up realizing is part of the problem is the way I am right now. And so he changes your orientation. And then when you go to resolve that conflict, you go, wow, that was that was great, Lord. We resolved it. Well, what God did is that he changed you first. And sometimes we need to come to look. Our saying to him, I am in need, is saying, you have an answer. I'm coming to the right place, and I'm going to get the right response. So it's the recognition of God's position and power. It's, it's the recognition of my place as I recognize his power. Jump down to verse 8 because we're going to cover this, this, this whole piece of recognizing God's position and power. It says, it says, there is none like you among the gods. Now here, there's a recognition of two things. One is the recognition of the truth. There isn't anyone like him. And I like what he says, among the gods, there are other gods. There are other things, places, people that people are putting as their highest priority. A God in your life holds the highest position. And now you may have many because you may have them by area of your life. When it comes to my economics, I may have a God and that may be my career. Although God uses the career, God says the career is not your highest source. He, it, the, the career is not preeminent in your life. It may be uh, it may be physical. And although you work out, and we should, and although you may spend time in the gym, that is not the pinnacle of your life. Because we know you can work out all you want. We all are one sickness away from not being able to go to the gym. It may be relational in that we take our relationships, and although we need them and we should have good relationships, we take them and we place them as the pinnacle in our life. And so we put on people the weight that they weren't meant to carry. Well, what weight is that? You to make me happy. And there isn't a human on the planet that can stand under that weight. They may make you happy momentarily, 
but they cannot satisfy your life. They were not intended to. And so we are throwing on people what we should be throwing on God. So relationally, you know, and, and, and now we come to spiritually. We want the church to be that spiritual pinnacle in my life. He said, well, hold on a second. Well, don't I go to church? Yeah, you, you come and gather with other believers. But if that, if, if that spirituality doesn't rest with God at its highest point and it rests here and here is where you feel and sense your spirituality and it's not with your individual relationship with the Lord, you're in trouble because when this place gets on your nerve, now you have nothing to grow by. See, the deal becomes, although this has a place in your life, it doesn't occupy the pinnacle spot. So when he says there is no God, there is none like you, what he is saying is that, you know, there are lesser gods, there are lesser things that people put in high places, but there's none that occupy your spot. And for some of us right now, we are dead tired, exhausted, because we are running, placing these little gods in the place where only God himself should be. And we're wondering why we're frustrated. So he says, there is none like you among the gods. And then I like what he says. Not only is there none like you, there is no one doing what you do. Because he says in the next one, he says, nor are there any works like yours. Like, Hold on for a second. He says, wait, wait. Not only can they not compare to you in person and in character, they're not even doing the same thing. Well, let's look at what is God doing, and let's look at what we're doing. Let's look at that for a second. So what is it that, 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 that he is doing? Verse 10 says, for you are great and do wondrous things. It's one of the things. And he says, he says you are good if we look further up and we go up. He says, for you are good. Um, in, in verse 5, for you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. He says, these are the things that he's doing. And that goodness speaks of pleasant. That good thing speaks of appealing. So he is doing good and appealing things. But you say, well, I don't always find what God does appealing. That's because your heart is not in the right place with the Lord. See, when I desire God, what he's doing is pleasant, even if it doesn't feel pleasant. See, the deal becomes when I am going through something hard and difficult, and yet God has my heart. You know what he's saying and what he's doing? I'm working on you. Okay, let me hear. How many of us, at least with some regularity, go to a gym? To work out, how many of us? You, you can raise your hand. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna look at judge and say, really, you go to the gym? No. <laughs> you, you said it with me. But think about that though. Is every exercise that you do pleasant when you do it? Let me tell you, when 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 I had lost quite a bit of weight at one time, there's one exercise. What are they called? Burpees. I hate those things. There isn't one time that I've liked them. Not one. I'm doing it, and I'm like, I hate this, but it is part of the regimen. Why? It's pleasant because I know the outcome is going to help that core. When I was doing those planks, pleasant, especially when you get down to the minute mark or you get down to the two-minute or three-minute. I know some of you hardcore, y'all are five- or six-minute planks. I'm, I'm not there yet. But you know what? There is that time where you're holding it. You know it's good, but it doesn't feel good. And I say for us here, when he said God is good and he does wondrous, he said he does amazing things. Now, I know we call so many things amazing. And some things that are average, we call them amazing. Amazing has become average. And God goes, no, 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 no. Let me tell you what amazing is. Amazing is when I take a person 
whose life was leading one way, and I pick them up and I change the trajectory of their life, and you don't even recognize who they are anymore. That's amazing. Amazing is when I heal someone and you are trying to figure out how on earth are they still here. Amazing, amazing makes your mouth hang open. Amazing makes your jaw drop. Amazing makes you scratch the head. Amazing makes you turn like the dog going, huh, what? God is amazing. I had a sister that used to say, only God is amazing. And she would only use that word when it referred to God. So what is the Lord doing? He said, he is good. You do great and wondrous things. And he says in verse 13, for great is your steadfast love. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. And he's saying, here are the things that God is doing. He says, for you, O Lord, he says that he is ready to forgive those who call on him. That's what he's doing. Then my question becomes, when we compare, what are we doing? So what are we doing? So if we want to compare ourselves to God, because he says, look, there is none like him and there are no works like his. Compare some of the works that you've seen and that people are doing. Compare them to him. And see where you want to follow. Some of us, I had this phrase said a long time ago, and I believe it. Some of us are so full of ourselves that we cannot be filled with him. There's no room for him. We are so full of us and our works that there's no room for him and his works. So let me ask you, what are you allowing God to do in and through you? What is he doing that you can testify to? And then let me ask, what are you doing? In response, no one is getting the results and the end that God is getting. And so understand that is when you and I are refreshing and we come to him and we come to him his way, no one is getting the results he's getting. You may be getting some results living life your way. You may. And you may have some success. But I have to ask you, are you getting the results that God wants to give you? And are your results lasting? Can you sustain them throughout your life? Can you sustain them even when opposition comes? Can you uphold them in any economy? Can you cause yourself to continue to thrive when everything around you is falling down. Can you do that on your own? The question becomes, are you getting the kind of end that only God can get in your life? And then lastly, recognizing not only our position in God's power, recognizing our privilege gets us refreshed. What is our privilege? I like this verse 2. I'm going to jump back up. Verse 2. He says, preserve my life. And for most of us, we stop right there. He says, preserve my life, O Lord. Preserve my life from living raggedy. Preserve my life because I'm living it my way. Preserve my life, O Lord. So I can keep doing what I'm doing, even if you don't approve of it. We would never pray that. And yet, many times we say, preserve me, O Lord. And the question has to be asked, why? Why should you and I be preserved? And sometimes we like to claim Hezekiah. I'm Lord. No, I'm not ready to die. And I want 15 more years. I was like, why? If the 15 years in the future are going to be like the 15 in the past and you haven't been walking with the Lord, the question, I almost want the Lord to say, why should I let you live? If you're not making any impact now, there will be 15 more years of no impact. See, the deal becomes, he says, preserve my life. I love that phrase, for I am a godly man. God, I am am living out your will while I'm here. Preserve me. And the implication is so I can continue to live out your will. And so it is preservation with a purpose. What is your purpose for being preserved? Why should God keep you around? 
Why? So God, so I can enjoy life. Is that all? See, you and I are here to enjoy him and to enjoy what he's provided. Now, but that is implied that I'm going to live within his will. So I love that he says the privilege we have for preservation is with a purpose. The second privilege we have is relationship. This whole psalm is a servant to master relationship. The relationship itself, the relationship itself is the privilege. I get the privilege of being the servant of the Lord. Sometimes, although I have lived as if, God, you get the privilege of having me as your servant. I've lived like that. I don't know about you. I have. God, you get the privilege of knowing me. Because I've just kind of put my life. It's all about me. It's, 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 it's surrounded by me. It's for me. It's by me, so I think. And so we act as if, God, you get the privilege of living around me. And instead of waking up every day going, God, I get the privilege of living under you, around you, for you, and thus my decisions reflect that. The next thing that we get the privilege of is the recognized character, the revealed and experienced character of God. Two things, his graciousness, and that graciousness is favor. It says, be gracious, verse 3, to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all day long. He says, favor me. Be compassionate because you are looking my way and you are choosing. Not you happen to look my way and you happen to see me. You were looking for me. And for the follower, for the servant of God, for the one serving God, God says, I'm looking for you. That is a privilege. That's what graciousness means. And then the next one, he says, gladden or rejoice my soul. So he says, rejoice my soul, Lord, and I will. So gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. He says, look, I'm coming to you because I know you can lift my soul. I'm not seeking entertainment alone to make me happy. Entertainment is fine, and it has its place. But God says, if your life is filled just for entertaining, you're empty. But instead, he says, he says, Lord, I know you can gladden my soul, so I come to you because I know you'll lift it up. Do you know that? Do you come to the scriptures? Do you come to the Lord? Do you come to him, him whatever time of day you come looking for him to gladden your soul because you are reading about who he is or you're experiencing who he is? And you're not just looking for the next song to pump you up. You're not just looking for the next entertainment event and venue. You are looking for him. Because you know he will gladden your soul. Also underneath his character, his revealed character and his experienced character, he allows us to call on him expecting an answer. Have you ever had someone that you've tried to talk to that you know was ignoring you and had no intention of answering you? Have you ever had that before? Well, that's the worst feeling. You, you, are, you literally are. Let my mother used to say, that's like talking to the wall. You literally are talking to, no one is going to answer you. That is the worst feeling in the world, but the best feeling is to have an audience with, some, with someone knowing that they will answer, knowing that they hear you, knowing that they are ready to answer. God says, you have that privilege. Are you using it? And then the last two things, and I'm going to ask you some questions, and we're going to get out of here. He says down in verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. That's interesting because the word for teach there, that Hebrew means shoot straight, Lord, that I may know your way. It is an archery term. It's really interesting. He says, so he said, Lord, 
Shoot straight so I can see clearly the correct path. I don't want to just live anyhow. I actually don't want to just wander around and maybe I'll find the path. He says, Lord, aim and shoot because that's where I'll go. When he says, teach me your path, when we want to be taught by the Lord, what we were saying is, Lord, I'm looking for where you are shooting straight. I'm not trying to play games. I'm not trying to live anyhow. I'm not saying all paths lead to God. They don't. I'm saying shoot your way straight, and that's where I'm going. That's a privilege. I don't know that we recognize that. God is saying, I've shot straight, but you're over here. I'm shooting right here, but you're like, well, God, I'm making my way. I'm coming to you, Lord. God said, no, you're off track. I've shot straight, and you're up in the mountains. I've shot straight, you're down in the valley. I know that song sounded well, but I had a hard time with that old time song. I'm I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. Sometimes the mountainside is rough if that's where God is leading, but you don't have to choose the rough side to prove anything. I'm doing my best to make it in. God says, I've already provided for you to make it in. I'll need you to do your best. You know what God needs? Obedience. I've shot straight. Where are you? And boy, sometimes I said, but God, I, I, I don't want to be there. Well, then you don't want to be with me. Because we want God to change. God says, I'm not changing. Because any other path is not good for you. And then lastly, he says, so teach me and I'll walk. And then this last one, he says, unite. He says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart. In essence, so that I can fear your name. Do you get that? The privilege is God works in our lives to give us an undivided heart. He says, unite my heart. My heart tends and is prone to be divided. Lord, unfortunately, you are not the only one that has my affection. And I recognize that, and I need you to unite my heart. He didn't say unite my life. He didn't say unite my family. I like what he says. He says, unite my heart. Because at the center of all I am, at that decision-making, compassionate center is my heart. And God says that if I have all your heart, you can do anything. Show me a man or woman that God has all of their heart, and you have a great tool in the hands of the Lord to accomplish anything, great or small, hard or easy. God says that when your heart is united and is united to fear me, and that is to be in terror, yes, and awe, yes, and respect, yes, of him, you will walk clearly. But for many of us today, our hearts are divided. Once again, not divided because we do different things, nothing about that. Divided because our affections are shared. See, our our affections, as we close, should be prioritized. And sometimes we have affections misplaced. And God is saying, I need to be at the top of your affection list. And when I am, I govern everything else. Your relationship with loved ones, your relationship with career, with school. But God says it starts with, is your heart undivided affectionately for me? Then you will fear my name. As a matter of fact, you want to be smart, you want to be wise? Scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning, you just getting started, of wisdom. And we think is the end all in it. So let me ask you some questions for you guys. Are you recognizing the position of God and your resulting position? Do you realize where and who God is and thus where and who you are? Or are you still trying to make yourself equal with God? There was a being that did that. He said, I will rise to the mountain, I, and, 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 I, and he kept saying, I, 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 and God said, you will be brought low. That was Lucifer himself. Had it made in the shade, built like no one else was built, and yet it wasn't enough. I wanted to be equal with God. That is a futile pursuit. 
Second thing he said, uh, the question is, are you still trying to elevate yourself vigorously? Or are you willing to let God be elevated in your life? If you are busy trying to champion and elevate yourself, you're in for a fall. How are you recognizing the privilege God has given you? Or are you busy filling your mind with how important you are? Let me ask, are you being refreshed or are you exhausted? If you're exhausted, maybe you need a new view or a revived vision of who God is. David says here, at the end of verse 10, he says, you alone are God. You stand by yourself. There's no one else. Are you going to refresh? The only way you do is when you look to focus on, hone in on God and who he is. And when you do, when you do, you'll surprisingly probably find yourself in a position to where you have strength like you thought you never would have. How am I handling this? How am I getting over this? How am I getting through this? What? I never thought I would have this kind of strength. God says, it's because you've looked to me and let me handle all the rest. But God, it's not even working out like I thought it was, and I still have strength, and everything is not even right. Things are still seemingly going wrong, and I still have strength. God says, it's because you're looking to me. A, master, a, a servant calls on his master and finds refreshment because the master has everything he needs.